Hello everybody and welcome to the Sam's Report. Today is April 29th and this is the last last Friday of April. And wow, um, I don't know where this month went to be honest. The whole month is over and a lot of good stuff. Again, Microsoft going on this week. Uh, some good stuff coming up next week, a little bit different. But you know, that's the way of the world of Microsoft here and boom so let's just dive right in shall we uh just a couple things to start here i'm going to be in san francisco next week there is a OneDrive for business and sharepoint thing so i'm going to be traveling on tuesday and wednesday which means gabe will probably release a build but uh yeah so be curious to see what's going on the OneDrive for business side specifically just because it's been a little bit of a cluster and there's been a lot of complaints about that product, um, but the new OneDrive Sync client is supposed to remedy that problem, but we will see what is actually going on. So yeah, so if you're in the San Francisco area or if you're going to that event, although I suspect not too many people are, um, I shall be there. And if you wanna hang out, let me know. But let's just dive right in. What went on this week? A lot of good stuff went on this week. A lot of good stuff went on this week. Uh, Microsoft released the Wordflow keyboard for iOS. So if you have an iOS phone and you like the Wordflow keyboard that was on Windows phone, you can now get it on your iOS device. And this has been leaked. Actually, I think I was the first one to talk about it, saying that it was coming, and then some pictures leaked and all that good stuff. But now you can actually go out and download it, and it's just a plug-in. Now, the biggest problem I have with this keyboard is not the keyboard itself. It's that Apple's integration of third-party keyboards is terrible. I mean, it is awful. So the, the problem is, is that sometimes the keyboard doesn't open or sometimes it opens to the default keyboard or sometimes no keyboard opens. So people suggested as a workaround that you just delete the default keyboard, but that didn't really work for me. Um, actually, that increased the, X, the issues of just no keyboard opening. And then, so this isn't a Microsoft problem. This is very much an Apple implementation problem. And it's really annoying because I like the keyboard. Although I will say that the Apple keyboard is, I think, spaced out a little bit better for two-handed typing, but I generally like uh, just first off the look of uh, the keyboard. I think it looks a lot better. I think there's some great features. I like the one-handed mode. I wish the keys were spaced just a little bit further apart because I do have some missed tap typing, but it's one of those things that I'm sure I'll just get adjusted to much like I did when Apple's came out, uh, you know, with the original iPhone and all that good stuff and whatever. So that is now out. You can go download it. The problem is, Apple. So hopefully they figure that stuff out. And yeah, I'm trying to read the comments while doing this thing is not working out well because my microphone is right in the way. But anyways, Wordflow, go grab it. It's worth trying out. Um, speaking of the app world, actually some really good stuff happened for Microsoft this week. And this, this is actually a pretty big deal, at least in my opinion. So we've got some new apps coming out. For the desktop, we have Facebook and we also have Messenger. Uh, this is Facebook or Facebook Messenger coming to the desktop. This is a really big deal. These are high profile apps being fully updated and polished and looking good and seeing that Facebook is now into the store. Hopefully other developers will now follow suit. And that's a pretty big win for Microsoft. And on the mobile side, actually, there was a lot of really good stuff too. Um, I shouldn't say a lot of stuff, at least one really good thing. Instagram is now on Windows Phone or Windows 10 Mobile in a well-supported fashion, unlike the previous beta that was garbage. And this is actually a really big deal because Instagram is one of those killer apps that people talk about that was missing. And now that it is out on the device, it's gonna be, it, it appears like it should be updated much more frequently and kept closer in parity to the iPhone, uh, iOS and Android version. So this should actually make a lot of Windows 10 Mobile users very, very happy. So this is actually this was actually a really good app week for Microsoft from that because that Facebook is huge and they had a killer quarter by the way they completely crushed it so they're not going anywhere a lot of people use Facebook a lot of people use Instagram and now on Windows it just got a whole lot better so that's actually a really good move a really really good move for Microsoft and I'm actually quite happy to see that and hopefully we'll start to see other developers kind of follow suit and we'll see the Windows Store kind of grow. But who knows? Who knows? And actually, I think it'll be important to notice uh, how quickly, I was going to say Apple, how quickly Facebook keeps this product updated. I can't imagine they're going to let it fall behind, but that's something to kind of keep out for. So that was the new apps. Um, also on the app side, Microsoft delivered the first public preview of Skype for Business for the Mac. So if you're on a Mac and you want to use Skype for Business, there's now a public preview for you out there. You can just go out there and use it. I don't know. For the people that needed it, this is obviously a pretty big deal, but 
Um, for most people, this isn't a, too, a big thing. Actually, I can't stand Skype for business, not because it's a bad product or whatever, but every time I, I dial into a Microsoft thing, it always gets installed on my PC, and then every time I reboot, it shows up, and it's really annoying, but that's Skype for business. Um, anyways, um, other things that happened this week. So an email was picked up this week by Windows Central, and... Yeah, so it was Terry Meyerson talking about their support, and I believe it was sent to an OEM or something to that nature because only Windows Central got this, which was a little odd. Usually when things leak out from emails like this stuff, like many of us will will get it, um, but not this particular one. So essentially the, the nutshell is after kind of the hoopla of everyone writing their uh editorials that Windows Phone is dead. Terry sent out an email and said, ah, no, we're not really dead yet. It's not dead. It's just shifted in focus until a later time. And it was really just kind of probably like a corralling of their vendors and partners and everybody and saying, hey, look, we know you made investments in these products. We're not screwing you over. That's kind of really what I got out of it. And I, I don't ever think Microsoft will truly ditch Windows 10 Mobile. They've got too much invested into it. They really need a mobile platform and they're not totally going to abandon this. I don't think they ever will. But what they will do is what we've already seen is they they just scale down their ambitions and their workloads and just trying to keep it a real niche thing until they can invest the proper resources again for when the time is right to actually grow the product and the brand. And so that's kind of what I'm seeing here out of Terry. And the other thing that was in Windows Central post that I haven't uh, had a chance to chat about with people inside the companies, they're now saying there's a Redstone 3. I had not heard that. Um, I, I still haven't heard it, and that's the only place I've ever actually heard Redstone 3 be mentioned. But I know there's Redstone 2, and I know there's Redstone 1, but um, yeah, Redstone 3. I'm not so sure about that. I'm going to try to see if I can figure anything about that, but if they do, then that's kind of I don't know. It seems odd because they made this real big public circumstance, circumstance, pomp and circumstance, whatever. Uh, <laughs> they made this really big deal about that they were going to do two updates a year. They're going to rapid release cycle of all this Windows stuff and that they were going to be tick and talk type mentality. And then all of a sudden, OK, we're only doing one update this year, not two. And we're only going to do two updates within a code name. And then now there's three. I don't I don't know. I don't really know about this. And anyway, so if you if you know if Redstone 3 is legit, let me know. But supposedly that's when the next Windows 10 Mobile big update's going to come is that next iteration of Redstone. So, we'll see. We'll see what happens here. But that is what's going on in the Windows Phone world, and I, I really again think that this was just kind of like a calming of the water type thing from from Myerson. I don't know why else they would send something like this only to their OEM partners. So if you have any other details about why Mike Myerson did this, I don't, I'd love to hear it, but that's the only logical conclusion that I can come to at this time. Considering we, we roughly know the roadmap of what Windows 10 Mobile is, nothing until early next year, and that's about it. So maybe this is just to tide people over, I don't know. It was just kind of an odd timing for something like this to come out. But yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the Myerson documentary that came out. Um, documentary. Man, I'm suffering with the words today. Uh, the Myerson memo documentary. I don't know what, what's going on. It's Friday. I didn't sleep so well last night. But uh, the Myerson documentary. But anyways, uh, moving on. So the bigger stuff that came out this week was actually Windows 10 build 14332. And this is, again, another release of Windows 10 Redstone. We know that Redstone, which I'll get to here in a little bit, is coming at the end of July. And there's a couple of new things in this. Actually, the, the stupidest thing in this that I'm really excited about is Network Speed Test is now going to be built into the settings menu. So if you've ever gone to speedtest.net to test your network connection, you'll now be able to do this very simply inside of Windows 10, actually with inside the settings menu. Now, the functionality is broken in this build. and for the people who are going to call me out, technically, yes, you could have always done this using PowerShell, but I'm going to go with 99% of people don't know what PowerShell is that are using this product. It's a it's a admin power user type thing. And so now you'll be able to go into the settings section, hit a, hit a little button, and it will give you your speed results for your local network. This is actually really nice because it, it's just a built-in feature, especially for this time. You're like, hey, is my network down? This will tell you very quickly uh, what is going on. So, speed test coming. Um, 
Cortana can now also search Office 365 content. So this feature is now in this build, but I haven't been able to get it to work and I don't actually know of anybody who has. So I'm wondering if it's actually broken in this release, but uh, that makes complete sense. Cortana, Office 365 content and yeah speaking of cortana and this is this is kind of a a sensitive thing for some people because some people got really bent out of shape about this microsoft is now blocking uh third-party search hacks with cortana so if you use cortana it's now only going to work with bing and it's only going to work with edge there was a workaround that would allow you to use google and so this came out and people freaked and so i, I love reddit for this exact reason because you go to reddit and it's conspiracy theory garbage and everything else you can imagine that goes against what Microsoft is actually doing. So you go into these comment section and they say, by Microsoft doing this, this is they're limiting my rights. I want to return Windows 10. Uh, but really where things went is that Microsoft is spying on me. And so the, this converse, this little like overhanging cloud over Cortana and people are saying, I'm disabling it, and they're all freaking out. But I guarantee you all these people are using Android and Google. And then there's people actually in the comment section highlighting how Google does this thing. So imagine you have a pair of headphones, like a pair of uh, Bose headphones open in one tab, and you go to search it on another tab. Google actually knows what's open in that other tab and can do contextual search based on that other tab to give you better results. And people in the comments saying, this isn't spying, this is just Google making a better product. But this is exactly what Cortana does with contextual information. Like people like are really bent out of shape that Cortana is just, all it is is just an NSA agent living on your desktop spying on what you do. And yet they're very happy with that Google can do contextual search or that Android reads their emails for better advertisement. Um, like if people haven't figured this out, Google is only mining this information to sell you better ads. Same with Facebook. Microsoft is not an advertising company. They, they don't, sell this information and, and who the hell would buy it? I don't know. Maybe there are some marketing firms that want to know what you're clicking on on the desktop, like if you're how many right mouse clicks do you perform in a single day? I don't know, but that that's kind of got blown out of proportion that Microsoft is doing this. Um, I'm a little bit indifferent on if they should really lock this down. I think they're doing it out of an aggressiveness because, hey, they can. If this was 10 years ago and Microsoft made this maneuver, there was no way that they could have gotten away with it. But now that Google and Chrome is a very competitive browser, um, Google is doing fine and that they're no longer the only player in the industry, they can do this stuff. Like, and I don't think this is out of the norm for them. They want people using their browser and they want people using Bing. And so when they see people can work around it, um, it you know, they put it under the umbrella of this is the best experience. If they were truly doing that, they would have just left everything as is and let people do the hacks that did a workaround. Because I really don't think the vast majority of people are executing those hacks, but they're gonna lock it down and they're blocking that kind of stuff. So I, I don't know, I mean, take it for what you will. If, if you don't like using Edge uh, and you wanna use Chrome, I think Microsoft should let you do that. Now they're putting it and saying, no, you really shouldn't, you can't, blah, blah, blah. I think it's just a matter of time until somebody finds the next workaround but limiting choice is never something I'm a, I'm a fan of. But I've, I, again, I, I just think this is what Microsoft is doing now. This is They can get away with this stuff. They can lock you into their ecosystem. Everybody complains that Apple does this too, but nobody really goes, but it's just the way Apple is. And I think Microsoft, to some degree, to some degree, not all in like Apple does, um, is the same way, right? You can't change the default browser on iOS, you can't, uh, Siri is always going to, actually Siri always works with Bing, I believe. Um, you can't change Siri to Cortana or any of that kind of stuff. It's just the way it is. So yeah, that's just kind of what the new Microsoft is. And if you have a big issue with it, I don't really know what to tell you. I would say just try to get creative and find workarounds. Um, personally, I don't use Cortana all that much. I use the search very frequently. I, I will, I know I hit that Windows key and type lots of stuff and search all the time and i do use chrome but so we'll see how this plays out until edge is at least a usable or a better browser it's getting there i think the anniversary update will bring edge up exponentially uh, in terms of usability but at the current moment because i'm still on the rtm or the november release edge is not a great browser yet uh, it's getting there in the insider builds but not yet so 
Anyways, um, other things that came out, this actually showed up last night. Uh, Microsoft is building a, or building, well, they're putting it in preview today. I got the email this morning, which was a little weird. So Microsoft Flow, which is an if this, then that, or ift uh, competitor, which is really just a back-end piping system. I'm surprised it took Microsoft this long to create a service, but really what it allows you to do is use um, any, really, any of the major services on the internet, like Dropbox, Google Drive, OneDrive, anything in the Microsoft suite will work. And let's say you upload a file to OneDrive, um, it can then send you an email or it can put a notification in Slack. One of the examples they give is, let's say you get an email from your manager. It can now, using the service, you can actually have it ping you in Slack that, hey, you just got an important email. Um, another example they had was that if uh, you uploaded a document, um, to OneDrive, it can then populate a list within SharePoint. And really what it's doing is it's if this, then that. That's all that it is, but it's a Microsoft iteration of it. And it's now open and free. Now they, the, the wording they use made it seem like this may not always be free. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure how they would get away charging with something like this, unless they just bundled it inside of Office 365, which I could see them doing. That if you wanna use the service, you gotta be you know paying for a subscription. But that is now available, and if that's kind of your jam that you needed, and if this, then that competitor, or you didn't like it, or I don't know. Um, I, wondered, I wondered, too, when I started reading about this, if this has anything to do with their bots, if it's kind of built on that same framework. So it sounds like a bot type thing, but they're not quite calling it bots. I don't know. They're calling it Microsoft Flow. It is now in preview. You can check it out. I posted it up on Petri, and yeah. All right, so let's get to the big news. Uh, this week, I wrote up that Microsoft would be announcing new hardware at E3. And the internet kind of went crazy with this. So a couple things here. There's going to be a new standard controller. I have seen it, so I know what it looks like. Um, yeah, and it's nothing crazy. Like People are like thinking there's going to be like microphones in it, and there's like Cortana integrate. No, it's, it's a very generic looking controller. Um, I believe they're going to start shipping it with new consoles. And to be honest, not much has been updated. It's just a slight revision of the current one. It, like people went crazy with this. And, but really where they went nuts is, so there is another hardware announcement. And it, I know some details about it, but I don't want to go into it because one of what happened when I made this other post. Um, two, one of the reasons I posted that up there is I'm hoping, and this happens sometimes when I post stuff like this, people who have information that aren't sure about it will start messaging me. If you do know stuff about it, please let me know, and I'm happy to collaborate, and we can you know, do a co-authored post on two different sites. I'm totally down with that. But I'm trying to just flesh out what's right and what's real about it. And I believe it is much larger than a controller. Uh, it, not larger like physically, just more like, hey, this is kind of cool type thing. And so the internet went nuts. I didn't write anything else other than there's going to be another hardware announcement. And then I started getting like people saying, no, there's not going to be Xbox One version two coming. I never said that. I didn't say anything. I didn't make up stuff. Like people are saying that Xbox One, uh, like next gen hardware is going to be announced to build or build E3. No, that's not what I'm saying. Like people are going nuts and the speculation has gone crazy. And then people are saying, well, Microsoft is denying that their next gen hardware is coming. Like, I'm sure they did because that's not what I said. So, like, really kind of watch what people are writing uh, when they're regurgitating stuff because they're speculating. Let me just kind of encapsulate things that I heard. Uh, many, many months ago, many, like January ish, January, February, I heard that Microsoft was working on an Xbox Elite V2 console. Um, version 2, not not next gen, just version 2, whatever that may be. I would imagine like a solid state drive and some other good stuff. But yeah, I heard that they're working on that. Now put that in a bucket. And then I get a tip from um, some reliable people, people being plural, that there's going to be some hardware announcements at E3. Put that in another bucket. Like these are two totally separate things. And so yeah, there's some hardware coming. We know it um, looks like a standard controller. And we know that, yeah, I don't know. Xbox Elite V2 is in the works. Whether that, whether or not these are the same things, I don't quite know. I'm still trying to figure out. If you know, let's talk. I do know some other details, and maybe I'll be able to write about them. But I don't, I don't want to speculate uh, anymore. And the other thing is too is theoretically Microsoft may not announce this stuff at E3. Traditionally they have announced this stuff there and this has been like they announced the Xbox Elite controller I believe they had their console at the event uh, the next 
Xbox One, this is where they typically not going to make their big announcements for the year. And so this is where I would imagine this is where they're going to make this announcement. Technically, it's possible they may not. They could hold off, but I don't think they're going to do that. But, um, yeah. So that's the Xbox stuff. And if people are writing that next-gen hardware is coming, they have reading comprehension issues. And this got a little bit larger... <laughs> <laughs> a little bit larger in scale than I kind of thought. I was just like, hey, I heard there's some new hardware coming, so I wrote it, and it came from a reliable source, and then people just went nuts, just nuts about it. So as I learn more, I will be sure to let everybody know, but until then, just know that something is coming, but I don't quite... it. it I don't think it's going to be mundane. I really don't. I think it's, it's going to be kind of neat if it materializes the way I think it will, um, but it's not... I don't think it, this isn't like a HoloLens type announcement where they come out and like minds are just like just blowing up um, all day long. So, uh, so that's the Xbox stuff. Anything else that came out? Uh, let's see. So a duplex, good guys over at duplex. I like what they do. They give us some information that we would never know otherwise, and they get it from advertising stuff. But they are now saying that the Lumia 535 is the most widely used Windows phone. Uh, this is kind of a big deal, sort of, because for a very long time, the Lumia 520 was the most prevalent phone. Now, it's not a big surprise because these phones, 535, I think, super cheap. Um, like... At one point, they were like 25 bucks on sale. So it's not really a big surprise that these devices are the most popular. But if that's what you were wondering uh, was the most popular Windows phone, it's now the Lumia 535. One nice thing that they did note is that the Lumia 640 XL is actually growing in popularity. Again, it's a cheaper phone, but it's a large screen. Actually, the 640 is pretty good. I have one uh, over there, and I actually do quite like it. So not too surprised to see that one is growing in popularity. Other things that are going on. So... I still don't have the new Outlook.com theme, as apparently as do the majority of people. Microsoft, uh, talking with good friend Mary Jo Foley, uh, said that only one, oh, I should say only, I know, caveat, 175 million of 400 million accounts now have the new theme. They're rolling this out and obviously hitting 400 million accounts does take a while. And they pointed out that this isn't just a reskinning, they're actually moving uh, the accounts onto a new architecture, uh, onto a new service. So that's why it's taking a little bit longer, but 175 or 400 million, now have it. I don't, I really want it. I'm envious of those who do have it, but yeah, it should be coming soon. Uh, something else that happened this week in the world of Office 365, Microsoft, uh, to their credit, patched a bug within seven hours of being told. Now, this is a pretty complex uh, security vulnerability, and I highly recommend you. I wrote it up on Petri, but really what it was is that just about anybody with the right knowledge, of course, knowing of the exploit and how to execute it, could hijack any federated Office 365 business account. So basically, if, if you fall into that bucket, your account was exposed, and the researchers who found it went to Microsoft in January and disclosed the bug. Microsoft patched it with in seven hours of being told. I'm guessing... The reason for that, one, it's always good to patch vulnerabilities quickly, but I'm seeing that you could hijack an account, an email account, along with OneDrive and just about anything else. This should have been rated a critical security vulnerability, and they put all resources to fixing it, and that's why it got fixed so quickly. And it, Microsoft acknowledged it uh, yesterday or the two days ago, and they were part of the bug bounty program, and these people got paid for it. So there you go. A bugs in Office 365 do occur, and apparently they do get pit, patched pretty quickly. Other things, Xamarin SDK is now open sourced. And let's talk about another post that I put up this week. This was what I told Paul was a terrible scoop. I mean, technically nobody had really written this, but it was so blindingly obvious, is that Redstone is targeted for the end of July. Actually, the week of the 15th is when they're trying to finish up um, all programming. Now, it might happen before then, because Microsoft, from my understanding that Windows 10 Redstone development is going well, uh, mostly because these are all add-on features, right? They're not completely relaunching the OS. It's not like a scramble until the end. But I've been told that the middle of July is when they're going to attempt to be finished, if not earlier, and then ship it right around, ta-da, the anniversary. Now, the 29th does fall on a Friday. I'd be surprised if they actually release uh, an OS update of this caliber on the 29th. So it might come before, potentially a little bit later, but it should be right around that time. 
And one of the questions that came from uh, user Team56 in the chat room today, he said, uh, today's question, now that we know the Redstone 1 is coming out in late July, do you know when the new features of Redstone 1 will be locked down? So I have a pretty good idea of this, actually. I, I believe, so there's, there's a couple stages of what is locked down. So lockdown initially is, okay, they look on paper and they say, these are the features that we're gonna include. And then they go start building the features. From my understanding, all of the underpinned features have been locked down. So they're not gonna add anything else. Now, with that being said, we haven't seen everything. That just means that all the features that are in progress are slated to ship. Obviously, we get too close to the end and they're still buggy, they'll pull them, but the underpinnings, non-visual stuff, mind you, is locked down and that those core features are in full development or nearing the end of development. And what we're seeing now is the visual elements being applied to those underpinnings. So that's from what I heard. So the question is, when is everything locked down and we're only going into bucks? We're getting actually pretty close. Generally around June, uh, is when things, at least going from last year, is when things kind of start to get locked down. And we know this because, I should say, we know that things are starting to slow down in terms of new feature development, et cetera, because Microsoft is actually doing bug bash weeks. This week at Microsoft was actually a bug bash week where people just focused on smashing bugs, which actually kind of tells me that hopefully the next couple builds of Redstone should be pretty stable if they're, if they're going aggressively after this stuff. And they were very uh, open about this. They actually put some bug bash quests into the feedback hub and the it's real obvious to to figure out why they did this right they have scenarios where they have bugs and so they put these quests in they get users to replicate the issues they get more data it makes it easier to understand what the bug is so that's that's kind of where things are going on um, i still expect to see a few new features coming out that hopefully should be announced soon or at least show up in these insider builds i don't think there's I, I want to say I don't think there's anything major, but I, I always get surprised by some of the stuff the later we get. I don't think we're going to see any like groundbreaking new features. Uh, we'll see some updates and some other things, but the visual elements are really starting to come together. And yeah, you got to remember that they've only had, they've had less than a year to build all this stuff. So don't expect like revolutionary new things coming because they've only been doing it a year. We're no longer in that three to four year development cycle like we typically had with Windows. So that's kind of the Redstone end of July stuff. Um, one thing that came out that is not really Microsoft related, but really impacts a Microsoft service. So Dropbox this week announced placeholders. Yep. Um, Dropbox is, yeah. Dropbox pretty much announced that they're beating Microsoft to their own punch here. Um, this is really annoying for me because I, I use OneDrive, but I have a ton of photos in OneDrive, so I don't sync them to every single machine. This is where placeholders would be super helpful. I mean, I have thousands of photos of my kid and vacation and tech gadgets that I don't store locally. Um, I, I don't store them locally for obvious reasons. I don't need you know, 500 gigs of data on a Surface Book I, of, of photos. I don't. And so placeholders make it super easy that if you're out and about, you can go look and you can browse all the stuff. And if you want that file, you double click it, then it downloads and it's great. And so Dropbox now has this feature in OneDrive. They're still not talking about it, but there's some, there are some more hints. So Dropbox now has placeholders. And it's the first time I've really been tempted to move at least my photos away from OneDrive. Um, if Microsoft really doesn't get on the ball and we don't see this in Redstone 1, I seriously might go and move my photos to Dropbox. I don't care. I know it's 99 bucks for the year, but... I, I like that functionality. With that being said, a good friend Walking Cat noticed that there is a new tag, and I, I'm not going to pretend I'm technical enough to know where he found this, um, but it's a new tag for a type of file in Windows, and it's called cloud. Uh, it was just under underscore cloud. And his first thought was that these are going to be used for placeholder files uh, for OneDrive. I've, I've still heard that OneDrive is working on placeholders. I, they better be, especially since Dropbox just announced it. And that's kind of the feature I'm waiting for them to talk about, hopefully in Redstone 1. But that tag will hopefully be utilized for new files that you're going to designate ones that stay in the cloud, are going to be viewed locally, and blah, 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 blah. I think that pretty much, um, you know, beating, beating that stuff into the ground. So kind of getting to the last thing here, 
Uh, Windows 10 popped up during a weather report, and I've seen that there's some questions in um, in the in the uh, chat, and I'll try to get to this in a second. But a Windows 10 popped up during the weather report, and obviously this is kind of funny from several angles. One, it's kind of people were bashing it on Microsoft, which rightfully they should. They've been super aggressive with this stuff. But really, the reason why this popped up, especially in a weather station, so on a newscast, a live TV newscast, regardless of how big your market is, you probably have an IT admin who's running the back end. These operations are large enough that this generally happens. Um, and so this weather presenter is going up on the up on the green screen and says, hey, you should update to Windows 10. And there's pictures of it all over. And really, that was the fault of the IT admin. They should not have allowed that stuff to happen. But yeah, so it's just kind of embarrassing. And those were some of the things that were um, going on. Oh, so that's kind of been the week of Microsoft. And, you know, it's been another good week. I'm curious to see what's going to come out next week with this OneDrive for Business stuff and the SharePoint stuff. And, it, yeah. So somebody, I don't know, we'll see, we'll see what happens next week with Microsoft. I'm hoping we get another new build. They should start to be coming more frequently. If you remember to last year, the closer we got to the launch of Windows 10, Gabe started pressing the button like crazy. I remember, the, I think it was oh, the week before release, they pushed out three builds in one week. And I, considering that they've kind of lowered the bar of what is an acceptable release for insiders, I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing the frequency ramp up on the on the builds that we get i don't know if that'll start next week but considering they're bashing bugs all this week i it would be very surprising if we did not get a build next week unless gabe and all the team are traveling um yeah so that's that kind of stuff and kind of dumping through the questions if you have a question now is a really good time to write it so i don't have to keep scrolling up is somebody asked why is the rollout so slow i said i understand a slow rollout but over a year is unacceptable so i kind of agree with this they announced it a very long time ago and, the, and they're referring to um the outlook.com upgrade and yeah no i completely agree i completely i kind of hit on this that it's a big architectural change underneath i think microsoft had screwed up by announcing it too early i think it was fine when they announced that they were updating the 175 million or whatever or to what they're at today but I, I really do think that they announced this too early. I think they got a little bit ahead of themselves. They said, hey, we're going to run with this announcement. And then, yeah, much like they did with OneDrive when they said OneDrive is going to be unlimited for free forever. No, that was a total screw up as well. Microsoft should have never made that announcement. And then it bit them in the butt because they very poorly uh, went back and tried to pull that back in, rake it back in after some exec shuffles. And it was, they basically just hacked together a word press post and yeah uh raymond wants to know when will windows 10 rt come so this is an interesting question i don't know how closely you follow what i do on twitter so i have i don't know the answer to that and i don't know if there is an answer to that but i can tell you that microsoft compiles arm builds for everything uh on a frequent basis i don't know if it's as quickly as the desktop stuff so i don't quite know i do know that they are compiling arm builds um, they're also compiling desktop builds. They're still making Windows 10 RT for the desktop or whatever they're calling it. Um, I don't know if we will ever see it, but yeah. Um, another question comes is, is Brad, I don't game now, but need an Xbox One for development purposes. Should I get a refurb? I would, yeah, I would totally buy a refurb. Actually, I tweeted out um, a link. There was an eBay shop selling refurbs for under, I think it was like 189 bucks. Don't, I, I don't know if that came with a controller or whatnot. But if you're purely doing development now that, well, I'm trying to think. So you got to be careful because I don't think you can convert your Xbox One yet to a dev kit. I think that's what the anniversary update that will come in July. You'll actually be able to turn any console into a development console just with uh, just a, a change of a switch um, in the settings panel. So there's if you're purely doing it for development, um, if you're already in the ID Xbox program, then sure, go ahead. But if you're just doing it on a personal stake, then you might want to wait a little bit. But it, it, if you can get one, get one of those refurbs, I don't see why not. Um, speaking of Xbox, my power supply is probably about to die on me on mine. I use my Xbox a lot. Um, I really love the Xbox One. But my power supply is now making a really loud, like, it, there's something to do with the fan is what it is. And so, yeah. Um, somebody asks us, have you heard if Microsoft may incorporate some of the SwiftKey features into mobile? 
Um, I don't know. I they have Wordflow. I don't know what they're doing with that technology. And SwiftKey was remember an acquisition. So there you go. It, it's an acquisition. I don't quite know, but as Knight Rider points out, uh, what is Microsoft's Microsoft's strategy with all of their keyboards? By my account, they have at least four or five across four platforms. The keyboard, I. I think it's, I don't know. So uh, some of these things come out of the Microsoft Garage. Don't confuse what happens in the Microsoft Garage with Microsoft's overall strategy. A garage is just an incubator where if somebody wants to go play around and build something, they can do it and it is what it is. It's just kind of the standalone little incubator inside of Microsoft. So anything comes out of there. Um, yeah. I don't, I honestly don't know because I don't, I can't see keyboards being a big driver of like, upsell to Office 365. Like if you download Wordflow, I don't see you downloading Wordflow and going, oh, this is great. I'm going to go buy Office 365 now. Like I don't I don't quite know what the objective is with this. Maybe they look at a branding thing and maybe it's this. Maybe they want to look at the iPhone since they aren't making the hardware or the OS. They want to look at that thing and say, hey, we can customize this to make this nearly and completely Microsoft, right? So you've got a better email app. Um, you've got Cortana instead of Siri. You've got a Microsoft keyboard. And you have all the productivity apps. And maybe that's their strategy. Maybe that's what they want to do is just try to customize an entire phone to their own stuff. Of course, they can never replace Siri because that's an Apple thing. But yeah, Eric asks, um, do you see cable card support for Xbox One? No, I don't. Um, I'm trying to remember. I got tipped about this for a while. And I thought they said it was not coming. Cable card has just been a, a tragedy of a good idea executed very poorly, not just by Microsoft, but by like a whole bunch of organizations. Cable companies <laughs> were never really on board with it. It was an, anyways, uh, the, the Xbox DVR that is coming, uh, I believe only works with over the air content. Now I do believe that you'll be able to stream that over the air content once it's recorded uh, to your PC, which will be actually pretty cool. I do like that idea. And yeah, so I want to end here on a question that I asked um, on Twitter this week is if Microsoft built an Android smartphone, would you buy it? And there was like 300 results and it was like 59 or 49 to 51%. Like it was really tight about which way it would go. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious, like what would Microsoft do that would be different? And to that answer, I don't quite know. Obviously it would come with Cortana. Um, as a launcher, they've got several launchers that they could use. Um, they've, you know, put all their apps and they can pretty much make this thing Microsoft. Now, granted, they probably need to use the Google Play Store, which has its own caveats, unless you're in Europe, where the EU is now going after them. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. But I don't really know. I don't really know if it would sell. Because look what BlackBerry did. BlackBerry put Android on their, oh, on their hardware. And it's not really, it, Android is not a saving grace right people kind of think android was the hero because samsung adopted it and samsung did really well no samsung they adopted it but what they did really well was they created great hardware and they created a consistent model and then now they're not doing so well right now but um that's kind of where that idea that android was a hero and because you got to remember when android came about there really wasn't any great os there were, well there was ios and then there was windows mobile what was it 6.5 or whatever it was um, many, many, many years ago. And then there's this Android. So it was new, it was fresh, it was free. And I think that's where people get this idea that Android was saving things. But I think it was really just, it was a right time execution by Google's part. And remember, Google bought Android. Um, so just remember that. And that's where people get this idea from. But anyways, I will end it there. So today is April 29th. This has been another episode of the Sam's Report. I appreciate everybody watching. Have a good weekend.